Thank you for being here and uh, taking time out of your schedule to share some of your thoughts. And we're going to just talk for a few minutes and then get questions from the audience. But I just want to thank you for your leadership and your persistence over so long a period of time. And for your passion for the poor and the vulnerable and for making a difference. And hundreds of millions of people are. It's just an extraordinary story. And I guess as you've traveled the world and the country, why is Green Bank so relevant today? What is it, what is it, why is it so important and why are so many people gravitating to it? Thank you. Can I just a big applause for the musical group? <laughs> system never got to them. Banking system in some ways stay up and there, reaching out to the rich people, never coming to the people at the bottom. Uh, only thing uh, your people could reach out to uh, is something they wish they didn't exist, the loan shark. So they're the victims of loan sharks all around the world. For centuries they are victims of loan sharks. Everywhere. Not only in Bangladesh, you name it, they are there. In the Philippines, they are called as a five and six system. Uh, the reason they are known as five and six system, uh, you borrow 500 pesos in the morning, you pay 600 pesos in the evening. 20% interest per day. So you make it how much interest rate per year. That's a very flourishing business. You go any town, any little you'll see them. Uh, so this is an example. So it's always there. It's, nobody came forward to make it a different way. We saw the loan sharking in the village of Bangladesh. So that's what the beginning my uh, involvement in that. And you, and you see it in a face-to-face -face way and you feel terrible about it. And one way I tried to resolve this conflict in me that I cannot do anything. I'm so helpless person. I said, I can do something for a few people. Why don't I lend the money myself? So that was the beginning uh, of my story uh, of lending money. And then it grew. Then we got the banks involved, despite their uh, objection that poor people are not credit worthy. So in order to make it happen for them, I offered myself as a guarantor. So that is a series of activities that happened. We created a bank, a main bank. It's working in Bangladesh. Uh, then people say, oh, it can happen in Bangladesh. It's impossible to do it anywhere in the world. Because Bangladesh is a funny country anyway. <laughs> so it can all kinds of things, gimmicks can happen here. Uh, luckily, in another country adopted it at the very early stage, Malaysia. Uh, then people start explaining, well, these are Muslim countries, something to do with the religion. And then it started, the next country was Philippines. Then they say it must be Asian phenomenon. <laughs> so, always an explanation. And then it was flourishing around the world, but it was not taking hold in the US. Then they said, well, we tried 500 times through 500 organizations. It doesn't work. It's not for the United States. And I keep saying that you can try 5,000 times and fail every time. I'll still say it can be done, you're not doing it. That's when the challenge came, why did you do it and show it to us and accept the challenge. I said, let's try it in New York City because the challenge came from the New York City. So that's when the Grammy in America was created and we sent Shana once, who's sitting here from Bangladesh. He said, you go and do it in New York City. So he came from Bangladesh, set up in Queens, in the Jackson High, and that was the beginning. So what I'm saying in response to your answer, need is always there, but some and some uh, step to be taken uh, was not there. But not every, as you said, not every microfinance, micro loan program has been successful. Many times, hundreds of times, and there's actually in Los Angeles, many attempts to do it. What makes the Grameen America, the Grameen model special and successful? Uh, 
uh, well, now you can compare it side by side because you say it's happened in Los Angeles, why it didn't happen, why it's working? Because you already have a working thing that there are 2,000 borrowers, and uh, here the, the deployment is near 100%. So it's there, and it's working for the last two years. So it's not something that I'm writing an article that it will happen, it can happen. It's not can be done, it's already done at the 2,000 borrowers level. But at the you're saying that we'll do it 13 branches, which is a large number. Uh, New York City, there are eight branches now. Yeah. With eight branches, with over 25,000 borrowers. So it's a uh, longer history, about six years history now. Yeah. So it's, it's a done, it's a, it's a, there may be problem in future, but for six years it has done, and, uh, it's continuing. Uh, the repayment in New York City of all the branches put together is near 100%. Uh, that's a high kind of bar uh, to uh, lift a program at that level. So I would say it's either they were not designed appropriately for the kind of people they were approaching, uh, or that management system was not the kind that uh, needed to be done. Whatever, I cannot explain. But, but the fact it, that this one works. There's, there's some particular elements to the Grameen model, though, that make it different. And if you could talk about some of the principles that you brought in that model that make it successful. There are a lot of elements in the Grameen model. For example, one basic model right at the very beginning of Grameen Bank when we were still in this village around the university. Uh, we made that basic principle of the world should start like this. People should not come to the bank. Bank should work. We always follow that. Today, with 8.5 million borrowers in Bangladesh, with nearly 80,000 villages in Bangladesh, we work in every single village. And our work is done on a weekly basis. Every week, borrowers to pay a little bit of uh, installment so that you gradually pay back the loan. So every day of the week, our staff is going to those 8.5 million borrowers to village within five days so that their job is done at the doorstep. So that makes it very convenient for the borrower side, very tough on the bank side, but we took the tough part to make it comfortable for them. Because women don't uh, have a, a cultural environment to go to an office someplace and do the business every week. So if you ask them to come and pay your loan at, uh, every week at the office, it will never be done. It's, die right at the very beginning. So we reversed it and it happened. And one easy way I try to explain, give an impression what Grameen does, I said, uh, we, we try to learn how the conventional banks do the work. And once we learn how they do it, we do the reverse. We do the <laughs> <laughs> so that kind of encapsulates everything that we do. It's almost uh, all that we are familiar with is done the opposite way. Like we are not office based, so we go out to the people. Another one, in a conventional bank, if you are a borrower, you have to go to the bank and convince them that you are really good in this business. And you want to make sure that they understand give all the records, all the things. And uh, we do the reverse. We go to the people and explain what the main bank does. After listening to everything, she said, Thank you, I don't need any money, you can look for somebody else. So, because she's afraid to. Think about taking money from an institution we never heard of. And in, in our own language, the word bank doesn't exist. They don't understand what bank is. For poor people, the word bank doesn't exist as an institution. So in either way, they don't know what a bank is. So we have to come and explain what a bank is. The closest phonetically sounding word in Bangla is a fraud. <laughs> That's a bank. <laughs> so we start giving them the impression of what, so that they remember the word. So we start saying that you can say fraud, since it's done, she says fraud, so similar to that. So then we explain what it does. Mm. So this is the beginning. So completely separate than what the conventional bank does. So when then uh, we finally she said no, we said okay, we go back to her again and again to build confidence in her. So that someday she may think about it. That's how it all happened. So that's again a different thing. We made it easy for people to pay back. Make it small, so that it doesn't hurt. If you have even 
take and say fifteen hundred dollar loan. If you say at the end of the six months you have to give me fifteen hundred dollar back. But she has the fifteen dollar to pay you back at the end of six months. But the spare that fifteen hundred dollar hurts her. And she'll find a way how to delay not giving delay giving this money back. And that's the beginning of the trouble. So we make it so simple. Make it weekly, it doesn't hurt them. And because you are in earning income and you pay a small amount. And within six months in Los Angeles you pay back in Bangladesh, traditionally we have one year. In one year you pay it back. Make it small, easy and so on. And then suddenly you find out you pay back. In the beginning you're not sure whether you can pay back or not. That builds a tremendous amount of happiness that we do that. So confidence building by doing is very important. And five women getting together as a group is also confidence building. And we try to explain that when you are walking through a deep forest alone, you get scared. Unknown things all around you. And your little noise gets scared. But if you're two of you together working, a little less scared. If you're five of you working together, you're very confident singing songs, talking about yourself, and so on. Forget about what you're doing. So I said, this is an unknown journey that we take. If you have five of you together, you build your self-confidence, and it boosts each other's morale, and continue. That also helps. Then we bring weekly meeting. It's not that I, you come to my door, I pay you, and then go back to my work. It's not like that. See, community building all along. And that helps a lot. And all income generating purposes. So it's not something that you take the money and go buy something in this uh, shop, uh, consume in your home, uh, or something that you always wanted to have. It's not like that. You have to invest it to earn money. All the pictures you saw, it's all about running some business. So this is a this is a money to run business. So that it creates income flow. Then once you start seeing income is coming to you, you get very excited. So all this together, I think, makes a lot of sense to people. It seems very transparent. There is nothing uh, hidden, no hidden part of it. Uh, and we make sure, and again, one of the basic principles that we have all along, we will not do anything in our rules uh, which will make it painful for them. And no penalty, for example. We don't punish anybody in, a, in any circumstances. We are all very friendly. Even if you fail to pay back, we are still friendly to you. So we, we always work together to, to solve the problem. We tell poor people always have problems. That doesn't mean that you have to be perfect. Right? So as long as she's willing to pay, as long as she's trying to pay, uh, we are always together. We continue to do that. And they feel that, yes, as long as they help us so much, uh, we'll keep up the, our report very clean. So a lot of elements. And, it, and we don't want to oversimplify it, but there's some basic elements where you've turned the banking model upside down. Most banks would love a 99% payback rate of loans and uh, continuing loans. It's a system of trust, it's a system of communication, but it's centered around the needs of the individuals and the communities. And that's very different. Fol folks in foundations, we know that world, we think about the world that way. But having a business that thinks that way is dramatically different. I want to ask you, because I, I was honored to go to see you receive the Congressional Gold Medal. And uh, a lot of things were said about you that day, about how you've been disruptive and how you've been tremendously, had tremendous leadership in the world. But one of the things is you talk about entrepreneurs. And I think you talk about the word entrepreneurs differently than most people talk about people in a garage. Maybe it's, maybe it's because of the Bengali pronunciation. <laughs> no, no, not the pronunciation. No, no. But I think you have a broader, broader view of entrepreneurs. And I'd love for you to talk about that. Yeah. Uh, again, this came as we were. It became first uh, uh, some curiosity. Then it became a basic belief for me uh, that all human beings are entrepreneurs. So I'm not distinguishing one from the other. There are some entrepreneurs that are not entrepreneurs. I said all human beings are entrepreneurs. And people show me, look, this is not an entrepreneurial activity. And look what he's doing or she's doing. I said, yes, you can show me examples that they have not, they don't have the entrepreneurial ability. But I'll still think she has the entrepreneurial ability inside of her. She's not familiar or he's not familiar with it because society never gave her a chance to find this out that she had the ability or he had the ability. So society always kind of um, put the whole idea of entrepreneurial ability sealed inside 
for the whole wall, put it in A, so, so that it doesn't come out. I said, that's where society went wrong. Society became job-oriented society, forgetting about the entrepreneurial ability-oriented society. So there, we said, all we can do, you can find a job. And you don't find a job, you are unemployed. You are frustrated. You don't know what to do with yourself. You cannot think that you can do something for yourself. That doesn't come. Because society never told, told me that. Either you have a job or you are unemployed. If you are unemployed, society has to pull together to give you unemployment benefits. Or, if you grow, you are in longer term. Uh, benefit program. So you live your rest of your life under the benefit, under the welfare. That's the system we create. We never say, why don't you do your own thing? Why don't you get prepared for doing your own thing? We didn't create institutions for that. Because we don't believe in it, we didn't create institutions. So to me, entrepreneurial ability is built into human thing. Whether you are poor or the rich, or the entrepreneurial ability is the same. The most successful entrepreneur in the world has the same as the most poor person languishing on the street, as the same entrepreneur. But one has a chance to explore, another never had a chance to explore. One has been propped by everything behind that the society has created, encouraging and going top. Others always denied and rejected and rejected. That's what it is. So to me, that's the platform on which I work. And people say, well, you know, like this particular country, whatever that country is, they're not entrepreneurs. I said, that's what you think. You never found it out. So what I did to uh, challenge one of the things that I kind of faced, particularly in the US, or among the academics, always say, if my cricket is a good idea, but it, but it can work only for the entrepreneurial world. See? And every time I hear that, it burns me up. I cannot understand what's entrepreneurial. So I have people shouting about it. I said, look, to me, all human beings are entrepreneurs, and all poor are entrepreneurs by the same program. So I could, cannot distinguish between one or the other. This is an entrepreneurial form, this is not an entrepreneurial form. When I go to a group of women to explain to her about the bank, uh, after she learns, she said, no, no, not me. I never used money in my life. I'm scared of money. You give it to somebody else. Don't come to me again. I said, she's an entrepreneur too. I don't give up. I come back to her again. All these eight and a half million women that we have almost started like that. She had no idea that she had done it. It's an exciting thing for the first time when she starts money, earning money. She cannot believe she did it. When she pays back the first loan, she feels so tall. She feels she can conquer the whole world now. She found someone. And that's how they discovered herself. So my cricket is not just the amount of money you give. It's a, it's a key you give in the hands of to explore his ability. It's what's locked into it, she unlocks it now. And that's what the bank is talking about. Yeah, we, we talk about human potential, we talk about, we look at education, and who are those students that aren't succeeding, and what is the potential that we can unlock for their own, not just business, yeah. but for their own sense of satisfaction and fulfillment. Um, for me, it's such a bigger topic than even when I started exploring this topic for the foundation. Because it is about sufficiency of opportunity. Giving people the chance, that one chance, that they can unlock, as you say, with the key. It, it's extraordinary. Then one last question and then we'll turn to the audience. So, people here um, who may have triggered certain thoughts within them about what we're talking about. But why should people who aren't going to be part of the Grameen Bank and be a borrower, or no borrowers, per se, why should they care about the success of in America. How does it relate to them directly? Well, one is all people worry about the problems that they see around them. So this is one of the problems. People remaining at a very low income or no income at all. So if somebody can do something different that it starts income and moving up, it's not just taking the first level of income and frozen it. Just look at the history of all the borrowers in New York and LA. You see, the first loan is whatever that money is. Second loan is always better. Because she's always uh, arguing with you. Why can't you give me a bigger loan? 
because now she's confident, she can handle the camera. And very soon she can raise it because the auditory your confidence level goes well. So you saw, you see a trajectory for her. She see herself sees that trajectory. This is how I'm going to step one by one, and this is how I explain it. Her mind is start working inside. And I say as long as uh, you are at the same level that you have been always been, your mind is sleeping. Because it's no use. Because you, you, are, you are repeating the yesterday for today. And tomorrow you repeat the today, tomorrow, same thing. Because nothing changes for your life. Same pros and cons. But the moment you have the money, you start working, you start doing things. Every day is different. Then your mind starts clicking. It's, it's kind of, uh, you can hear your mind uh, working. Suddenly that machine became active. So you start dreaming. And that dream kind of pulls you forward. And you see your dream piece by piece coming to materialize by your own effort. Not because somebody did it, something for you or somebody else did something. All you did is a fueling process. That money fueled that thing and expanded yourself. So this is a, a thing that takes the person into different levels of activity and make you completely different person. And then children grow up in that family. That is another big thing. So you see how this process impresses everybody. And then you feel better as a part of the society. And you see things that you have taken for granted, nothing can be changed. If you have a problem, government will take care of it. That's how my attitude is because I'm so busy making money. I have no time to pay attention to you. That's why we pay taxes to the government, so that they can take care of it. I said, no, we human beings, as individuals, we are creators. We solve things that we see problems around us. We don't have to wait for the government to do it. Government is an entity that we created so that they can do things in a way that everybody can participate. That doesn't mean my responsibility is over. My responsibility is enhanced. Now we can work together. Collaborate what I can do, I do, and what they need, they need to do, they do. So it's not dumping everything on the shoulder of the government and making the politicians keep on promising, if you vote for me, I'll solve all the problems. And if we vote for him, he doesn't solve any problems. <laughs> <laughs> and then somebody says, I can do better, okay, then switch to him. Because it's impossible for government to solve all these problems. But for individual citizens, individual human beings, it is possible here because there's so many, and so many creative ideas behind us. Government doesn't have to get any ideas. Government is, has, a, has to function with, with bureaucracy. So bureaucracy, by definition, is not an innovative machine. It's something, it's a repetitive machine. It can do very well in a repetitive situation. But it's not good in an innovative situation. So human beings are very innovative. They can do things today and change things tomorrow because it didn't work. So I go for sex. Government cannot do that. Government has a lot of problems changing from day one to day two years. Because you passed the law, the next time you try to put any amendments, everyone says, How are you doing that? Because we did that uh, on the other day, we all said it would work, and now you can't touch it anymore. So it goes through a long process of any change. Even after that, you do a minor change, not good. Individuals can change very quickly, very innovative, adjust yourself, realize the reality very quickly. So that's where this uh, uh, thing comes, and I think people feel very good about it, and they should feel good. Because it's not about them who are taking the law. It's about us. We can do things. Thank you for that. And it's, it just tries to tie things together. If, if you were sitting where I'm sitting and you're looking in the eyes where the fire is coming out of his eyes, <laughs> the passion is emitting from him. After all these years, after seeing great success, and we're still not done. So please help me thank Professor Eunice. <laughs> Questions. Uh, just to remind you, questions usually start with a what or a why or a how. Um, we don't have a lot of time for a, a lot of speeches, but we'd love to hear your thoughts and questions for Professor Eunice. And we'll, I think we have one right here in, in the middle, and we'll keep on raising their hands, and we'll start right there. Well, capital is always important for any business and a good product, too. There are other aspects of business that are required. So things like uh, developing a business plan or marketing, distribution, finance, dealing with internet, social media. What business skills do you provide these entrepreneurs in addition to the capital to start their business? We, we, 
create ourselves a very simple organization, focusing on making sure we get the money and then start doing the job. Uh, for example, we don't give them any advice. What, what business is good and what is not good. We don't give them. And we justify it by saying that we don't know anything about their business. Who are we to tell them? We never did any business ourselves. Their life depends on that business. And we have no right to say things which will mess up their life. So let them learn by themselves. They help each other, learn from each other. That we facilitate, that's what they do, set the meeting and all that. But we ourselves get restrained from that. And people sometimes, in the beginning particularly, when everything was open and taking shape, they will always argue with us, why don't you at least give us some advice which business would be good and how we run it. And we train our staff, if somebody asks you that, or requests you to give advice, you always say, look, Grameen Bank has lots of money. I have no idea. <laughs> That's why we came to you. You have no money, but lots of ideas. That's why we have joined hands together. We give you the money, use your idea, and pay us back the money. That's it. So we, then we ask your counter question. We say, if we, since we have all the money, if you had ideas also, why should we come to you? We would have been using our idea to take more money ourselves. We come to you because you have the idea. Then they can very confident. Yes, we, are, we have ideas, they have money. So that's why they work, we work together. So this is a kind of a lively, light discussion to problem up to do that. If sometimes they see uh, we need some advice, how to take care of the cattle that we bought, uh, how to make sure that the, uh, its health is good. So we said, well, uh, there are a government office which is responsible for looking after the health and, uh, of the cattle and its animals. So we will connect you with that. We'll invite the guy who is responsible for these areas to your center meeting. He will explain and you can ask the question. We arrange that connections. But we don't take any responsibility. He said, after you listen to him, whatever he said, you make your own judgment. What are the things you will do? What are the things you will do? But these are the people who are supposed to be experts. They, they will show them what can be done. <laughs> so this matchmaking we have done, but ourselves have never done anything directly to advise or anything. We feel that they explore very quickly. If I go and advise this bakery shop owner how to make uh, all those uh, breads and things, uh, I'll, make a, I'll make a mess out of it. But they know, because they have this tradition, whatever they have in their family, in their individual experience because somebody worked for some bakery for many years. Now she is out of work, but she has all the knowledge. So she used this knowledge to build up a business herself. So this is how we have seen over time. I would just add really quickly because when I did the due diligence for the foundation, and this was a big question, what what happens? You know, they, do they know what they're doing? And until you get to this point where you say everybody's an entrepreneur, which is a big leap. And to say that this potential exists, and they bring the group together in this barn for a week, and they go through some financial literacy, some basics. And then, that group develops trust, and they start to share knowledge between each other. And it's just an incredible process. And then they go on their way. Because all the businesses are different. All the business and ideas are, are incredibly different. Other questions? We're going to take a few more questions. Yes, we're going to wait for a microphone here in the middle. There's two folks here, but we'll... Okay. Oh, sorry. Went over here. I'm sorry. Then we'll come over here. Sorry, I'm at the front door. Professor Yunus, yes. why women? I support it, but why women? Why not? <laughs> <laughs> in the beginning, in, in, in the historical context, that we got involved with it because I was very critical of the conventional business, uh, conventional banking, because they are not listening to me to open the door for the poor people. So I was fighting with them. And I was getting very nasty every day, attacking them. I still do. Uh, one criticism is, is they are wrong because they are denying the, the, uh, the services to the poor people. I said the logical thing for a bank should be, which is a bank as a, an institution with dense money to people, 
the logical thing would be to lend money to people who don't have money. I say you do very funny thing. You lend money to people who already have lots of money. It's crazy. They thought they thought I'm crazy, I thought they are crazy. So that's the beginning. And then I started accusing them. I said that, look, not only you're not lending money to the poor people, you don't also lend money to women of all categories, not just poor people, even rich women. They resisted that vigorously. No, oh, that's not true. I said, that's very true. Because in statistics I have from all the banking operations in Bangladesh, not even 1% of the borrowers happen to be one. So there's something wrong with your system. You deny the poor, you deny the woman. So you better fix yourself. They said, no, because women don't come to us. What can I do? It's a Bangladesh. So they don't come. I said, that's not true. You look at your rules. I said, a woman, a very well-off woman, she comes with a business proposal and gives it to the manager of the bank. This is my business proposal. I need X amount of money to run my business. It's doing very well. So manager will flip through the report, the, the submission that she made, and then say, have you discussed it with the husband? <laughs> and she will say, yes, I have discussed Does he support it? Yes, she supports it. I said, why don't you bring her, bring him along next Monday so that we can discuss this. I said, this is part of your system. That's what you do. Has it ever happened in the history of Bangladesh banking that a man brought a proposal and the manager took him through it? Have you discussed it with wife? <laughs> <laughs> why don't you bring her along? <laughs> So that's the problem with it. It is so different. I was telling this story about five years back in a conference in Geneva. And a, a woman was presiding over this meeting. This is on microcredit. So, and I told the story how funny it was, that the rules of the banks and so on. So when the meeting was over, so we were all leaving. The lady who was presiding, she came. She's a very senior officer. The government. So she came over, she said, you're talking about Bangladeshi bank. I said, yes. No, today I'm going to my Swiss bank with my husband. Because they will not approve my loan until I take my husband. This is really the Swiss law. So it's not Bangladesh. Something wrong with the whole banking system, including Switzerland. So that's the kind of thing. So when I began with my work, I want to make sure half the borrowers in my work are women. Because I've been talking too much with the banks, accusing them. I don't want them to accuse me this. Look, you did the same thing. So I wanted to make sure that it happens. Then we went to the women to make sure they come. Otherwise, we cannot make the treaty itself. The women can completely say, oh, don't give the money to me. I don't know anything about money. Why don't you give it to my husband? I said, well, we don't want to give it to your husband. I'm going to give it to you. Your husband needs money, she has, he has another money, so he can come, he will do that. But uh, this is particularly for you. No, 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 please, go to somebody else. I don't have any need of the money. I don't know what to do with the money. I have nothing. I don't know anything. So that's the beginning. So it was a hard task to come back again and again, explaining that she knows something. She's claiming she doesn't know anything. And I'm saying you know a lot. So I have to go on explaining again and again what she knows. In a group of meetings with the women in the village, some people go like this. We don't know anything. I said, okay, I agree. You don't know anything. Let's talk something else. Do you cook? And everybody laughs. Of course we cook. Women cook. So you know something. You know how to cook. You see, just now you say you don't know anything. Well, that's not a business. We do it for the family. I said, okay. Is there anyone who makes very good dish that everybody loves? Ah, she makes this dish very well. She makes this too very well. I said, okay, do you, you go and taste this? Uh, does she invite you to have this? Yeah, you go to the festivals and so on. We love her, this particular dish. But then she knows it very well, more than you. I said, yeah. Why don't you make this dish more than what you consume for your friends or your family? And sell. Because people like it, so others will like it. Then we're in business. Everybody loves. You don't cook food for selling. You 
cook for a feeding meal. I said, okay, if that's what it is, I can't do anything. And I said, when your husband comes from the town, does he bring anything for your children? Yeah. What does he bring? So somebody says this, somebody says this, somebody says this. Most of the food like sweets, something. I said, okay. He brought some. Where did he get it? He cooked it? No, he didn't cook it. What did he get? It? He bought it in the market. Okay, he got it from the market. Somebody must be making it somewhere. <laughs> Why do you think food are not sold? Somebody is making it, selling it, your husband is buying it, your children are enjoying it, and you say food is not to be sold? <coughs> well, sometimes we do it, but we don't. I say, now you do it. <laughs> That's where we have to know. To do it, something that you do. You need to do many other things. Do you raise chicken? I say, of course, you have to raise chicken all the time. How many chicken you got? I got three, I got four, I got five. Would you like to raise more chicken? Yeah, I would like to. Then why don't you do it? You don't, we don't have the money. See? We have the money. <laughs> Take the money and raise more chicken. Make it 50 chicken. So you know something. See, they, they are believing they don't know something. So that was the way. Try to make them feel that they know something. This is how it goes. teaching your model so that um, people interested in microfinance can go out and replicate successfully? The idea of microcredit has spread over the years. We didn't expect it, but it happened. We were very happy about it. People picked it up and started their own. Uh, some did it the right way, some did it the wrong way, some did it absolutely the wrong way. <laughs> and created a mess in the whole thing. And we had to go on very strong words saying, they are loan sharks, they are not microcredit. They are loan sharks claiming to be microcredit, all those kinds of things. Uh, we never made uh, uh, microcredit global like uh, Grameen uh, America or Grameen Global. We have not done that. Grameen America came again to respond to the challenge. It cannot be done here. So we said, it can be done. This is how it was. And then we said, what well, is done? Now do you want it? If anybody has the money to give, then we'll come and help you do that. Because we don't bring money from Bangladesh to do run and branch in Los Angeles. You have to find your money and we go and help you to do that. And we'll train up the local people gradually so that they can understand. People that we sent like uh, two branch managers here in uh, both of these branches in Boyleside and Westlake, they come from Bangladesh. But they will train up the local people so that they don't have to be in the branch anymore. They will be moving in a higher level where all the branch managers will be local people because they're already trained. It needs a lot of experience because there's nothing else to do. There's no legal mechanism by which you can protect. It's, a, it's something, uh, you, it's an art you have to learn through experience. And that's how it takes a little bit of time. So this is how it is done. Uh, anywhere we're invited, that we provide the money to come and run the show, we do that. Uh, globally, we have done in many other countries, we work similarly in China, for example, we in Inner Mongolia, in Sichuan, we have programs there. We work in Guatemala, Mexico, in uh, Colombia, in many other countries, in India, uh, in Kosovo, etc. But there are programs which we don't run, but others imitate and copy us in many countries. They run, do good work. We encourage them. We hold what we call microcredit summit every year. Bring all the people on microcredit together. Last year, uh, this year, in, uh, early this year, it was in Melilla, Mexico. The microcredit summit. It's an annual event. Uh, this happens from one country to another country. That kind of encourage everybody to get involved, and expand those who are deviating, trying to push them inside so that they don't deviate and stay on the course. This mission is not lost. Because the mission is a very important thing. If you lose your mission, uh, suddenly it becomes uh, just the opposite. Of it hurts people and helps people. Thank you. Sir, 
Where's the mic? Maybe I have a mic. Where's the mic for here? We're trying to get the, there's two hands here, one right here. And then I think one in the middle here. Right there. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Yunus, are there any minimum requirements for a borrower? And if so, what are those? We had some funny things, minimum But basically focus on the poorest people. You always train our staff. Find the poorest person in the neighborhood. Don't just give anybody who says he is a poor person. <coughs> always go to the person and say, is there anyone not as lucky as you are in your neighborhood? <laughs> and the funny thing, they become your guide. They help you to find the person. And we describe, you have this in the house, you have a few furniture. Is there anybody who, without furniture in Bangladesh? Uh, is there anyone with the leaky Your room looks OK. There's someone who doesn't have a room, so rainwater gets in inside. This is the other uh, two families we know here. I'm still in the water before I talk to them. So this is one good thing. The other thing we had in the Iran, uh, before you enter the Korean land, you have to dig a hole, use it as a latrine, because people go out there everywhere. So it's a spread disease, etc. So we wanted to encourage them to get to the habit of using latrine. But they said, oh, we don't have money, we're poor people. Then we came up with the idea, also, okay, we'll do something which it doesn't need money. Just dig a hole. <coughs> and if you need assistance to dig a hole, we'll come and help you to dig a hole. Don't tell them that you don't have the money. Uh, in the beginning, there were a lot of assistance to that. Why you make some uh, money with this digging a hole? We said, oh, that's the way you are. That's how the Grameen Bank works. So, Reluctantly, we just started doing that. Once we have gone over, then the next batch of people who are coming didn't argue because they follow that the others are going, and then old people are advising them, you want to join them in that? Dig a hole. <laughs> <laughs> so it's very simple. Otherwise, they won't even talk to you. So, so this, and as a result, we finished the whole problem of sanitation. We started digging loan to make a, a water sink, sanitary electricity. So all the families of Grameen Bank now have sanitary electricity. So that has transformed the village uh, sanitation situation completely. So we added those pieces together, one after another. Uh, the basic factor is a woman, extremely uh, poor, and then rest we can handle. If she says, well, I don't know anything, we'll put them in the context of other people to build up confidence we show. We know somebody in the next village who is it's in Worcester. And why don't you come and meet her? See what she's doing. She's doing wonderful. And we, that brings her confidence back. That yes, I can do better than her. So why don't you do it? Let's try. So this is how. Initially, they're very reluctant, very hesitant, very cautious. But once they see others are doing, demonstration is the best of the thing. Then they say, okay, I can do better than if she finds out her neighbor is doing something, she said, I can do better. <laughs> Almost. And it helps us. So this is how the whole thing is. And, and just again, because we went through this process and trying to understand things, and if you, if you use the traditional framework in your mind about underwriting, about financial requirements, about the application, about the need in that way, you're going to start to struggle. <laughs> because when, if you're trying to unlock the key to someone, really has need and really get to somebody who can't get the money. We did an analysis, we could give this to anybody who wants it, of all the banking levels in Los Angeles County. And where is the greatest need? And it confirms everything that Grameen America knows. At the very bottom, there's nothing except payday money, 400% interest, and really horrible things. So how do we, the minimum is, um, can you show up? Can we help you reach your own potential? Will you help, let us help you? I mean, it's just, it's, it's counterintuitive for some. So, I want to take a couple of questions because we have a little more time. Right, there's, right here, yes, there. Hi. Um, Hi. So, microfinance has evolved from not just loans, but including savings and insurance. So, I was curious, what's next? Do we see a world where these emerging entrepreneurs would be listing their business on a stock market? Or, you know, can we dream that big? Well, you, you use the word stock market. That is something we stay away from. <laughs> I hope this will never get to the stock market. Then, 
jól mint mobilik, de konsárt interesse. De tetszett a money stock market, és a president is able to make money. So they will be pulling this into the wrong direction. Uh, we see this as a kind of a category of what we call social business. Business to solve problems rather than make money for yourself. It's a business based on selflessness rather than selfishness. So stock market is the epitome of the selfishness. So we, we will create a stock market of our own someday, which will be social stock market. You go and buy the share of microfinance because it helps people, not because you make money. So you'll be looking at who is doing the best for the poor people, and you say, here's my money, I want to buy some share. So that means a separate one, because this is stock market, you see which company is making more money, so they put money and they'll give you more money. So that's the orientation that you want to divert from. Uh, we, uh, many things happen uh, in microcredit. We are just always talk about the basic thing, which is that thing. And you just use the word which is always forgotten in the discussion, savings. It's an integral part of the Grameen program. And one of the problems that we had in the USA, starting a Grameen program, not lending part, it was a saving part. Uh, in New York, I don't know how much here, it's $2 per week. Every borrower has to save. Is the same here? Yeah, all over. All over. Two dollars. Everybody has to save two dollars. A must. That's a part of your uh, work, like for taking a home. So everybody has to do that. They are willing to do that. There's no problem with that. But you cannot find any single bank which will accept that two dollars. That was the biggest struggle, and it's still a struggle. It's not a resolved issue. Some people take it for a while and they start kind of shying away from that. So that needs to be done. Savings is a very integral part of it. Today we lend up over one and a half billion dollars in Bangladesh a year. And borrower savings put together now comes to about 1.7 billion dollars. So you can imagine how part of the saving is. So they have more money to save it than the loan they take out from the bank. So it's a kind of reverse relationship now. So it's a big, big power. When we say what is the impact of micro I said, forget about everything else. They have so much money themselves. Uh, they can do anything. I tell them in Bangladesh, when people kind of joke about the main bank, oh, this is a bank of the beggars and so on. I said, don't ignore them. <laughs> don't, don't underestimate them. You are a big businessman. You are a brilliant dollar businessman. You know what? They can buy up the whole business, and one day, they have all the money to buy it up in cash. Very few people. You can't have that money in cash it's yourself. You have to make this, but they have not. So they are, as a group, they are a very strong community right now. So savings is a big thing. And we produce insurance, health insurance in Bangladesh, which worked very well for the first 10 years, but it started declining, not because of the problem of the people or the patients or the healthcare. It's because of the doctors. The doctors didn't want to stay in the village. We made the doctors to stay in the village to provide all the health care services against this insurance. And insurance is four dollars. Four dollars per family per year. And we take care of all health needs. And it's working, we can cover all our costs. It's a sustainable entity. And we are very excited that it was happening. For ten years we did that. But then doctors started disappearing from our clinics that we set up in the village temple because they have more attractive thing to do in the city. And being attracted to the government job, government job is something that you take the salary every year, every day, every month, but you don't have to do any work. <laughs> it's a fun thing. And you get promotions and all kinds of facilities after that. So everybody is attracted to that. So the moment government is recruiting, everybody who is a job who goes to the government. So we cannot retain. Now we are building up our own medical college so that we train our own doctors with understanding this is what their future will be. They will be in these villages that they will be spending time to come here and use the technology. With technology, we will be treating all the patients in the villages. So this is the new, again, build the insurance policy as well. The last point I will make, we gave encouragement to all the families to send their children to school. So all the children went to school you know, and gave them education loans and finished their college, finished their university. 
they, many of them have done that, but the problem is unemployment. So what we have done, we created a social business fund and tell them that you forget about it, get the job. So do, job is not something that you'll be looking for. You should be convincing yourself that you are not a job seeker, you are a job creator. So we are trying to bring them up as a job creators. So what we tell them, come up with a business idea and we'll invest all the money ourselves. And then you uh, bring a business person and return the money that we gave you. Because as a social business, we don't want to make profit out of you. All you have to do, just give the money that we gave you, exactly the same money, over a period of time. And we are happy with that. And we can give it to somebody else. So this is the new one. So gradually, one thing leads to another. There are so many other things, I'm just not giving details. One just quickly, it's a very fascinating one. We created a nursing college in Bangladesh as a social business. We take the girls from the Grameen families and enter them into the nursing college. It's a joint venture between Glasgow Caledonian University in Glasgow and our site, a joint venture. It's a beautiful nursing college. Today, almost everybody will say that it's the best nursing college in the country. But the girls are from the coming families. So we train them, give them education loan, so they don't have to bring a penny from their home. And the college itself covers all its cost. So it doesn't have to depend on charity coming in over here. So they've done. So Bangladesh needs lots of nurses. We have a very funny situation in Bangladesh, so far as nurses concerned. Our nurse and doctor ratio is very interesting. There are three doctors per nurse. <laughs> so it will be the other way. There should be three nurses per doctor. So there are lots of nurses needed. Our whole health system is falling apart. So I said, these young girls and young boys are sitting around doing nothing. And whereas there are so many people are needed, not only in Bangladesh, nurses are needed all over the world. Right now there are more than 100,000 nursing jobs falling back in the whole country, the whole world. So if you can produce those nurses, Many countries offer immediate citizenship if you accept the nursing job. So, but we are sitting around. I said, why don't we create social businesses? We have a series of nursing colleges. Our number one nursing college is on. Now we are about to set up a second nursing college. So we'll have a series of nursing colleges producing nurses so that they can get local jobs, they can get international jobs, wherever they want to go, we'll help them. So these are the kind of things. We add things, we keep on adding things. It's an endless series of things. Thank you. So, so uh, unfortunately, this part of the program, we we're out of time. So let me, let me just say one thing. If, uh, again, I had a traditional upbringing. I got an MBA. I did a lot of interesting things. And I, I read a book that, that Professor Yunus wrote on social business. And it's one of the most life-changing books for me in perspective. And one of the things that happens when we just talk about things like this some things have triggered in your own mind, however you've interpreted this interview and this talk and Grameen's model about our assumptions about things. We've got a lot of assumptions to question in the way we do things and how we view things and how we make changes. Because if anybody thinks here that we don't need change, then you're not paying attention. We need a lot of change. And the change, just like in the entrepreneurs, it starts with us. The key is within us to not think about this thing. The social business, the book, starts to reveals these businesses and the, and the philosophy behind this business, but the size and scope of these businesses and the impact of these, that starts to question the word business as well. Professor Yunus, thank you for your thank time. You. Thank you for sharing so much. Um, 